I'll ask you to begin with, and, and anybody else, the, the question's there for everybody. So when you heard this, and I know you've you know heard this before, you've read this before, of this throne room scene, which is what we call it, what anything particular stick out at you? Uh, yes, the thing that has always kind of struck me and stuck out to me is the part where there's this mourning about no one being <laughs> able to open the scroll. Oh, man. And then the triumph of there is one. Yeah. There that's is one. There is one. And and do you notice, I mean, so, oh, what a, what a scene. This, this, all of these scenes. Um, so there's this, all this, you know, John looks up and on this, on the throne, this, this, this throne dwell, dweller uh, has this, or there's a scroll and who can open it? And then the first answer is nobody. And what was John, did y'all hear what John, how he described his reaction when, so this, this must have been important to him that he find out what's in this scroll. Why do you suppose it would be important to him? Anybody? Put yourself in his situation, in his shoes. Well, it seems very important. It's got information that needs to be known. And and how is it it's presented? It has, it's sealed up how many times? Seven times, okay? Um, so think about it, folks. This is the beginning of a remarkable, over, almost overwhelming experience for John. And maybe in that scroll, there's more information about what he's doing there. And wouldn't it be nice, rather than having to try to translate spiritual images into human language, wouldn't it be nice to have a scroll that you could open and just read and then say, well, this is what was in the scroll. But then somebody says, nobody, there's nobody, nobody that's worthy, that's good enough, that, that's earned the right that's the, when you, when you see worthy in, in, in Revelation, that's what they're talking, it's thinking about no one has the right. No one has the authority. And then one of the elders, and hey, this is a really good elder. I've had me some dealings with elders that weren't always fun, probably because of me. But anyway, this particular elder is a really good shepherd, isn't he? Because what does he do? You can almost see him moving in the direction of John, putting his arm around him and saying, hey, hey. Because John is just crying. He's weeping. And uh, the elder says, hey, John, look. Look again, look again at the throne. See that lamb? He can open. He can open it. So we're going to get to open it. So uh, what I got from that part yeah. was the elder when he said, he said, Wait, somebody is worthy. It's as if Jesus had just prevailed. Ah. It was like it right at that time. Okay. That, that Jesus. That's an interesting. Is, 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 are the Zoomers able to hear that, you think? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's So if Zoomers, if you didn't hear that, what, what was just said was maybe it's, it's as if Jesus had just been noticed in a sense that he had just, oh, wait a minute, there really is somebody here. And that's it. We'll bring. We'll come back to that uh, idea, that thought that maybe that he had appeared or something. That was. That's good. Anybody else got anything else they want to say about the something that stuck out here? Well, you know, what you think of? looking as he as if he was dead. Yeah. As, it, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. That this this you find this a lot in the Book of Revelation, and really we do it all the time in our in our regular lives. We describe the situation that someone is in and it helps us understand something about that person for instance uh you see uh tom moses walking out of walmart well you immediately know he was in there buying something i mean you don't know what necessarily but you just because if you see him coming out of there you know that that's what he was doing and in the book of revelation you you see this uh, it, it, it's almost as if the way it would be translated in the book of Revelation uh, is instead of it's, you know, in, in the English translation, it says, and I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. And the way that they would have heard it in the first century was, I saw a looking as if it's been slain. 
lamb. See, uh, if you remember from, from chapter 21 of Revelation, John looks up and he sees a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of heaven from God. And a, a way to say that would be, somebody's, somebody's watching this on YouTube in the room. Um, a way to, another way that they would hear that in the first century was a coming down out of heaven from God, Jerusalem. See, the fact that it's coming down out of heaven tells you something about it, right? Okay, anybody else? Any other things jump out at you? What about that, those, those 24 thrones? What about, the, what about the four living creatures? Those creatures go east, west, north, and south. Right? Okay, we'll talk about that in just a minute. They had eyes all over them. The, were these? Okay, let me ask you this. And somebody just said, that mother just said they have eyes all over them. And where all do they have eyes? Everywhere. Eyes everywhere. Okay, let's be honest. I'm curious. If you had been there with John, how would you have felt? Would you have been comfortable in that setting? Would you have been uncomfortable? Would you have been frightened? Would how would you have felt? Terrified. Well, didn't he? Didn't John? No, from the Old Testament. Uh, didn't John know from the Old Testament? You know, there's knowing and there's knowing. Oh, okay. <laughs> right? I know there aren't monsters under my bed when I was a kid, but I still really thought there might be. <laughs> when something would move or like I knew better. But it really? Still get me. You don't think there actually could have been? <laughs> don't, don't do that to me. <laughs> I just got over that. Uh, you'll be sleeping on the couch tonight. All right. So now, what in the world do we do with this stuff? I, I want to show you a little something, and then we're going to focus in on um, on just a little bit of, verse, of, of chapter 4 and chapter 5. But turn over to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. And as you're turning over to Ezekiel chapter one, I want to remind you that uh, the Babylonians came in in 587 BC and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Now that was the third, actually the third wave of about a 25, 30 year period of warnings and, and threats from the Babylonians to the Israelites. And so the final wave, the third wave was 587 when they destroyed it. And it took them about a year and a half, two years. It was a siege. It was terrible. It was terrible. If you want to read about it, go and read Jeremiah. Go and read Lamentations. Read Lamentations. It was what you have in Lamentations is a description, probably by Jeremiah, the same prophet, the, the Jeremiah the prophet. And he, in the first two chapters, describes what happened in the city of Jerusalem. I mean, it took two years. They, they closed up the gates. The Israelites closed the gates of Jerusalem, and the Babylonians began a siege, and, it was, and people died in the street of starvation. Some of them took their own lives. Uh, it was bad. It was bad. And, of course, the children and the women, and the, they were dying first, and it was just, it was a horrible situation. Uh, but, but 10 years prior to that was the second wave. And so in what you find when you begin to read uh, Ezekiel chapter one is it's probably about 10 years before the destruction of the temple. It's about 597. And let's go ahead and just read a little bit and and you're, this is also apocalyptic literature. Now listen to how it starts. Start with verse one. In my thirteenth year, in my thirteenth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kabar, Kabar River, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year. Okay, well, before you go on. 
That was just verse one, right? That's just verse one and two. Does that sound familiar? Does anything, anybody go back and read Revelation, the prologue to Revelation in chapter one? What does John say? On the Lord's day, da 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 da, I saw a vision. And that, and and what's going on here is so. In the second wave, uh, the Babylonians went in to the southern, what was left of the southern kingdom, and that's when they took the exiles. And Ezekiel was one of the exiles. Does anybody know who some of the other exiles were? They're very famous biblical characters. Daniel. Daniel was one. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were others. So what, basically what the Babylonians did is they went in knowing that probably eventually they were going to have to come in and do what they did in 587 and destroy the temple. But 10 years prior to that, they didn't really want to kill the cream of the crop of the Israelites. So they went in and they kidnapped them and they took them, they became prisoners of war, so to speak, and they took them back to Babylon to try to make them Babylonian. Now, we're not going to take the time, but go, go read a, a little bit of the first few chapters of Daniel. Um, and, and you'll see, and even Ezekiel is, you know, these must have been, for whatever reason, these, these people must have really stuck out to the Babylonians because they were kidnapped and taken back to, back to Babylon. And so that was about 10 years before. So now we have Ezekiel sitting on the bank of a river in Babylon. Uh, by the rivers of Babylon. That, there's a song about that. Some, there have been some novels and poetry written about that with those titles, with that title. Um, and he sees this. So let's go ahead and keep reading. And I won't interrupt you for a little while. <laughs> The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kabar, Kabar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was on him. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light. Now, can you feel the, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. Okay. Can you feel the drama start to build? Huh? Did it, did, you guys got nearly three inches of rain here yesterday, right? Did anybody look out the window at about noon or one o'clock and say, hmm, it's getting pretty dark out there. Anybody do that? Pretty much all day. <laughs> so, and then you started hearing the thunder and the lightning. Something's coming. Oh boy, we're going to lose power. Oh my goodness. Better get, where's the, where's the cat? You got to find the cat. Somebody find the cat. You know. So anyway, this is, this is, so this, this is starting to, starting to happen with Ezekiel. He's starting to see this thundercloud this this storm is coming out of the north all right keep going center of the fire looked like glowing metal and in the fire there was what looked like four living creatures and i'm sorry to interrupt you again but <laughs> what he what remember he's told us i was given a vision from god i was given a word from god and god showed me spiritual stuff and now i'm going to try to use human language to describe spiritual stuff so what do you keep hearing him say appearance appearance looked like looked like he uses the word like remember we talked about that in one of the other classes so listen to how many times he says it, it's almost as if he's saying i really don't know how to tell you <laughs> how to describe this it was just best thing i can do it was it was like this have you ever seen one of these it was like that all right keep going in appearance their form was human but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight. Their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings. And the wings of, the one, who, uh, the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Okay, that's far enough right there. Uh, go ahead and turn to chapter 10. All right. So now we're what, what's he describing? Four what? Creatures. Four living creatures. What did we just hear about in Revelation 4 and 5? Hundreds of years later. How many of them were there? 
And what about their faces? What's going on here? Um, depending on the translation that you look at in, in Ezekiel, some of the translations will say they each had four faces. So, and, and, and notice one, one of the things that's consistent so far is that, that, they, that they have in common with the four beasts in the four living creatures in, in Revelation is that they have these different faces. And now let's notice the faces real quick because this is very important. Uh, and by the way, John doesn't, we talked about how John at times will hang tags on things so that we know what he's talking about. John did not have to hang a tag on this stuff because these people already knew. We don't, but unless you've studied Revelation, but they already knew. So why four creatures and why these faces? And the faces were, one of them looked like what? A, a, an ox. One of them looked like a lion. One of them looked like man. a man. And one of them looked like an eagle okay and there were four of them so i think it was, was it steven was it you that mentioned the four corners of the earth a minute ago i was noticing that they did look down one of the things that that anytime you see in the book of revelation this is a this is an interpretive tool what i'm about to give you okay anytime you see four of something doesn't matter what it is sometimes when, when things are happening, there'll be lists in Revelation, and it'll say, and da-da, 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 this happened. And there's four of, four, anytime you see four, what the representation is, is, is it's happening all over the world. There were four, just like today, we think of, you know, you look at a camp, compass, and there are four basic directions, north, south, east, and west, right? And in this case, there are four creatures in Ezekiel and also in uh, Revelation, but they're different. They're a little bit different. We got to talk about that too. But what about these different faces? Well, what, what, what's going on with the different faces is basically, and it's, and it's very interesting, the, the writer is saying that these creatures somehow represent everything in the earth. An ox is a domesticated animal. A lion is what? A wild animal. A man is what? A man. An eagle represents what? A bird. All the birds. Anybody notice what's left out? Fish. Fish are left out. And there's a reason for that. In, in, the, in, in ancient times, the people, you remember how scared the disciples used to get when they got on the sea and, it, and, they, and a storm came up? It wasn't just that they were afraid of, of drowning. They believed that if they drowned while on the ocean and they died and they went all the way down, that there was a, a beast called Leviathan and he lived down there and the, he would take possessions of their soul and that's where they would spend forever. There were no carnival cruise lines in ancient times. People did not go on the water for fun. They went on the water for commerce only, to catch fish or to move product from one place to the other. And they were considered to be some of the bravest people in that culture. People did not want to get in a boat. All right? That's... Well... That's right. That comes a lot later, but one of the one of the things that is described in Revelation four and five, as this whole thr throne room situation is being described, something that would have been very very suspicious to the people who were listening. Now you and I heard it, and we've even written songs about it. And what is described is. In, now picture this, anybody ever been to Washington DC and seen the reflecting pond, the reflecting pool? You know what I'm talking about? That great big long rectangular pond that stands between the, uh, oh, which memorial is it? The, 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 Lincoln. the Lincoln Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial and the, 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 
the, the Washington Monument. Okay, and in between that is this reflecting pond. Okay, um, in the description that we read in Revelation four, or that we heard in Revelation four and five, there is something, and it depends on the translation, the English translation that you use. It's sometimes there's this thing that's spreading, that, that's spreading out in front of the throne, and it is sometimes described as a crystal sea. Anybody ever heard that in a in a church song? Uh huh. Yeah. Sometimes it's also a sea of glass. And it's beautiful, just like everything else is, except the scary stuff in the book of Revelation. But if you had been an ancient, if you had been one of these people sitting around that had been gathered together because you had just gotten something from John on the, who's, who's, who's everybody knows he's exiled on that Isle of Patmos, but we got something from him and we're all gonna get together and somebody's gonna read it for us tonight. And you, you're very early into it. And this description of the throne room is, is going on and this crystal sea is described and everybody would, people would have looked at each other like, you ever, any of you that watch horror movies or scary movies and, you, and, and, something, and something's getting ready to happen, right? Somebody's about to open the door. And what do you sit there and say to the screen? Don't open the door. Don't open that door. Okay, because you know it's not gonna be a good thing. So, you know, it's like I heard, you know, you just heard all these terrible sounds upstairs. Music is Don't go upstairs. Yeah, and the music's building and all that. Well, there would have been when this, they would have been already, of course, in awe of this description of the throne room. But when the, especially they would have been suspicious about this quote unquote crystal sea because of the way they felt about sea, about lakes, about oceans. They, it, they, everybody pretty much that was there knew that thing looks crystal. It looks pretty, you better watch out, okay? Later on in chapter 21, I keep going to chapter 21 because it, it, it's the culmination of everything. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Sea. Because the sea had become an abyss and God had thrown the devil and his cohorts, the, the dragon, the beast, whatever you want to call it, into that abyss and had sealed it over forever and ever. And so when the new heaven and the new earth are coming down, there is no longer one of the, one of the things that they, that John says is, and by the way, y'all you, you remember that crystal sea that was in the throne room to begin with? Remember how that made you uncomfortable? It's gone. No reason to be uncomfortable anymore. It's gone. All right. So, we understand why there's four beasts. We understand why they've got the faces that they've got. There's uh, something else that I had never really thought about before until working on this particular you know, study. And that is that these creatures, it's very interesting that both in, uh, in Ezekiel and in Revelation, they aren't just called four creatures. What are they called? Four living creatures anybody got a reason i mean of course there wouldn't be four dead creatures right they don't fly around what's what's up with the four living creatures why living dale have you ever thought about that i have not i assume you have an answer i think we're going to get a hint from uh ezekiel chapter 10 just go ahead and start reading it and and, and how are we doing on time uh you have Got a few minutes. Okay, so listen, everybody. Same four living creatures, but they're no longer now called four living creatures. Oh, one other thing. One other thing before it. Well, let's go ahead and read it, and then I'll say, tell you one other thing. If I forget the one other thing, somebody say, Danny, what was the one other thing? Okay. Starting right, here. We go. Starting in verse one. Ver starting with verse one. Listen. I looked and I saw the likeness of a throne of Labis Lazuli. Lazuli. 
Easy for you to say. Yeah. yeah. Above the vault that was over the heads of the cherubim, the Lord said to the man clothed in linen, go in among the wheels beneath the cherubim. Fill your hands. Wait a with- minute. Wait a minute. What, what are they? They were called four living creatures in chapter one. And now they're being called what? No. Cherubim. Anybody ever heard of a cherubim? It's an angel. And, and by the way, so one of the things, two, two of the types of heavenly beings that we have heard about and sung about are seraphim and cherubim. Um, and now the, the folks in academia have decided that we should no longer call them seraphim or cherubim, cherubim but we should call them seraphim and cherubim because that's closer to the uh, original pronunciation pronunciation so changes the songs a little bit it changes the songs a little bit um go ahead and read just a little bit more fill your hands with the burning coals from among the cherubim and scatter them all over the sea and as i watched he went in now the cherubim were standing on the south side of the temple. And when the man went in and a cloud filled the inner court, the Lord, the, then the glory of the Lord rose from among the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. Okay, so that's enough. What, you have just, what you've just come to understand is that these four living creatures, the reason they're called living, it, it, it lets you know who they're involved in who they worship, and who they're from. They're from God. Anytime something is referred to as living or full of life, it, it's something that's from God. And that's why in, in Revelation, and, and remember, John's trying to decide describe something like, uh, and they're cherubim, and so let, let me describe them more specific, more g- generically. Cherubim. Now, how many of you have ever heard a baby described of, as as cherub, uh, not cherubim, but um, cherubic? Anybody ever use that word to describe a baby? Yeah. Cherubic. Cherubic. Never. <laughs> okay. Anybody ever heard that word? Cherubic. All right. There was a a moment in history where, do y'all remember the the, um, entity or personality that we sort of jokingly, maybe nonchalantly, maybe not jokingly, nonchalantly referred to on Valentine's Day? Who who is it that, that... that shoots Cupid. the arrows so people fall in love. Cupid. Oh, Cupid. Oh, yeah. Cupid. Well, Cupid is actually the name of a, of a god that had to do with love. But th- throughout history, as artists and poets got a hold of seraphim and cherubim, they lost their biblical appearances and took on uh, well imagine that t- different appearances that were more palatable um, and so when you talk about a, a, a baby being cherubic and you think about a cherubim you don't think about this beast uh, one of the things that if we were to keep reading in Ezekiel, and I don't know exactly where it is. It's in there someplace. It's in chapter 10. The other thing that, that, that is they have in common is they have eyes all over their body, both in Revelation and in Ezekiel. Anybody got a sense of why that is? All right, there's four of them. So we know that that means that they have been over the whole earth, right? They are in, the, in, 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 the, in Ezekiel, they're in, in, on the earth. In Revelation, they are in the presence of God. Now, why was the book of Revelation written? Always go back to that, folks, as you're trying to interpret. Why was it written? To, to, reveal, something. 
to tell people, I know you're going through tough things because of the gospel. Keep believing, keep worshiping, keep witnessing. You will be delivered. It may not be for a while, but you will be delivered. Yeah. So that's, that's the message. Everything that you read in the book of Revelation needs to be funneled through that, the, the primary message, everything that you read. And so when you see these four living creatures that are flying around, and the other thing they're doing is they're crying, holy, holy, holy. And by the way, there were a couple of songs that came to mind. Did anybody else think of them? The first one, obviously, that came out of this, these two chapters, the old song that we don't sing very much anymore, but it's a great old song. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. See, that's that's where that song came from. There's another one, and the and and it starts out with worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer, worthy of wisdom, glory, and power. Words right out of Revelation, and then the chorus of that song, if I can remember it. Worthy of wisdom, glory and honor, worthy of rich and da, 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 da. Anyway, worthy of earth and heaven's thanksgiving, worthy art thou, worthy art thou. That comes right out of Revelation 4 and 5. Okay, these eyes, these eyes that cover these beasts, They've been all over the world, and now they're back in, in, in the book of Revelation anyway. They're back in the throne room with God, and they have the eyes because what, what, what's the satellite plane? I mean, the, the surveillance plane, the spy plane that we send up now, they, the United States has, it goes two miles up or whatever and takes pictures of, you know, it's, y'all have heard about it, you've heard of it. Um, that's what these creatures have been doing. They've been traveling all throughout the world. The four, there's four of them, four corners of the world. And now, and with all of these eyes, they've taken all the information in and they've seen what's going on and, and appropriate and apropos to the book of Revelation, they have seen the suffering of God's children. And they are there to report. And that's why you hear over and over again in different portions of Revelation, God saying, and we've talked about this before as well, in chapter two and three, where the letters are, I know, I know. Because, you know, when, you, when you're going through tough stuff, sometimes you think is, you feel alone. Like you're the only one that's going through it, or you're the only one that's ever been through it, and nobody else can understand it. And you hear God saying, no, no, I, I know, I know. My creatures have been out there. Now, really, does God need the creatures? Of course not. These, this, this is the beauty of apocalyptic literature. This is just stuff that's happening. Now, I, I, wanna, I want you, if you have your worksheets, we're going to actually um, talk very briefly about something that's on the worksheet. <laughs> so read the title of the whole worksheet to me one more time, Dale, the title. Revelation, uh -huh. Apocalyptic Life Lessons, yeah. Interpretive Tools, History, Animated Political Cartoons, The Old Testament, and Great Paintings. Okay, so find on the worksheet there where it says Wile E. Coyote. Now, it's after the animated political cartoon. We've talked about the cartoon, and we're not going to take time to do that this morning because my time is short. But let's talk about cartoons for a second. Let's talk about the Roadrunner. Anybody ever watched the Roadrunner? And who was his arch enemy? Wild E. Coyote. Wild E. Coyote. Did Wild E. Coyote ever catch the Roadrunner? Did you know that he did? Yeah, he did. In one cartoon. You have to go look it up on YouTube. All right. So while E. Coyote would come up with all these wonderful, and one of my favorite things that he, you know, all these, these wonderful plans, he's going to blow up the roadrunner. He's going to, you know, what? and one of his favorite things was to find a great big rock and somehow balance it on the edge of a cliff that was right over the road that where the roadrunner was going to come running. And then he was going to pull the stick out or whatever 
and that the you know it was gonna <laughs> the, the it was gonna it was gonna smush the roadrunner. Okay. Now what inevitably happened? He would pull the stick out at the right, very exact second. And for some reason, as only happens in cartoons, gravity was taking a break. He pulled it out and what, and that rock by any realistic sit, ought to fall. But what does it do? It just stays up there somehow. I might be doing this just a little bit, you know. And so what does Wiley e. Coyote do? He runs over and he gets on the rock and he starts jumping up and down on the rock trying to get it to fall, right? Well, it finally falls. And as it's falling, guess what happens? Sometimes the rock is closer to the ground. And then sometimes, because we all know this is how gravity really works, right? Wiley e. Coyote would fall closer to the ground and they would do like this until finally, as it got to the ground, while E. Coyote would end up where? Exactly underneath the huge rock that was supposed to kill the roadrunner. Roadrunner's long gone. And it, <laughs> and it splats while E. Coyote. And then he comes out from under that rock. And what does he look like? Okay. Flat He's as a paper. Flat as a piece of paper. Right? But then in the very next scene, what does he look like? Now, does that happen on rain runs of gun smoke or bonanza? It only happens in cartoons, right? <laughs> there are things like that that only happen in apocalyptic literature. This stuff never happens in the gospels. There's some marvelous things that happen in the Gospels, including resurrection. But this, this stuff, this, this creature stuff, and this eyes all over, and this four, and, and the and the crystal sea, and the it that stuff that only happens in apocalyptic literature. And sometimes it almost, and the reason that I've suggested cartoon, and sometimes when I've suggested the cartoon concept, people say, Danny, are you demeaning revelation because you're comparing it to a cartoon. No, 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 not at all. I'm just trying to give us another way to think about it. I want to show you something that happens, and this is where we'll end our class today, and it's on your worksheet, so turn to your worksheet and look. I've selected four different, well, go ahead and read it. What does it say on the worksheet? Uh, after flat as a yeah, piece of paper. Piece of paper. Who is on the throne? That's it. Who is on the throne? Okay. I've got four little little snippets from four and five, from chapters four and five. And I want you to, you probably didn't notice this the first time we went through it, but I want you to notice something that happens in apocalyptic literature that doesn't happen in any other kind of literature in, in, in the biblical text, okay? So what's our first reading? Revelation. The question is, who's on the throne? That's the question. Or what, what describe the throne, all right? Revelation 4. One through three, and it is, who is on the throne? After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me, like a trumpet said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once, I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had an appearance of Jasper and Ruby. Who's on the throne? Is that that's all of it, right? That's it. Who's on the throne? Now, now, don't give me a churchy answer using only the information you've been given so far. Who is on the throne? A shiny creature. You don't know. Is someone? But what is what's the appearance? Jasper and Ruby. So would you say some someone really beautiful? Could you say that? Yes. Someone really beautiful is on the throne. That's all we know so far. So don't get ahead of don't get ahead of the text. All right. Now there's another little. You know, that's the first time we refer to the throne, and the first time that John looks at the throne. All right. Now we, what's the next verse? Who is on the throne now? Everybody with me? Everybody with you on the worksheet? Okay. Right. Revelation five. Uh, then one of the elders said to me. Do not weep, 
See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Who is on the throne now? So who's on the throne now? Well, no, don't don't say Jesus. You don't know that yet. I mean, you do. I know you do. But specifically, we're looking for somebody that can open this scroll. And even though it's not explicitly stated, it, it, the, the elders talking about the throne. So the first time that John looks at the throne, there's someone there and they're beautiful. The second time John looks at the throne, who's there? Lion of A lion. Of the lion of Judah is on the throne. Dude, dudes. I'm sorry, I'm used to this. <laughs> Folks, this is happening like this. This is not taking hours and hours to happen. This is a narrative. It took us four minutes to read this out loud. Okay. So one second. We got something, someone that's really pretty. Then we got a lion. Now let's keep reading. Same chapter. But where are we now? Who is on the throne now? Then I saw a lamb, verse six. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. All right. Who's on the throne now? What kind of a lamb? The one that had been slain, looking as if it had been slain. A looking as if it had been slain lamb. And there's a little more. What? Uh, so strange. What? What else do, do we know about this lamb? Seven horns. Seven and horns. Seven eyes. And seven eyes. Which, are which the represent seven spirits of God. Okay. All right. Now let's keep reading. So so far, in a matter of just a few minutes, we have looked at the same throne, and we've seen three different things. And now, ending chapter five. We're going to look at the throne one more time. Who is on the throne now? Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. So who's on the throne now? The king. Be careful the way we read that because we've read it and we've heard some of us so many times and then it, go ahead and read it one, for me one more time and I want you to see what's, going, see what's going on. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne to the lamb be praised. Okay, that right there. So we're looking at the throne one more time and there's not just one person there. To him, there's not just one person in the area of the throne or on the throne. Mm. To him who sits on the throne. And to the lamb. And to the lamb. The looking as if it's been slain lamb. Now, and this is the only point you're saying, this is the only point. It's a big point, folks. It's, it gives you a, a way to understand how to read this this, this book that's, that's fooled so many people for so long, the easiest way is the simplest way. In apocalyptic literature, just like in, and once again, I'm not demeaning Revelation by using this comparison, wouldn't bother any of us at all if we were watching a Roadrunner cartoon that Wiley e. Coyote is flat one second and has regular proportions the next. Wouldn't but we wouldn't stop. We wouldn't hit the pause button and say, "Anybody notice that?" Would you? Because it's a cartoon. It's the only things happen in cartoons, folks. This is it's not a cartoon, but it's apocalyptic literature. John's trying to explain with human language spiritual things. And in a matter of a few minutes, he looks at this throne and first, well, I won't go through it again. Well, <laughs> what we know, what we know, we, we haven't gotten any tags yet. Okay. We have not gotten any tags yet. 
So do we have some life lessons? Believe it or not, I have some life lessons for you today. Are you ready for some life lessons? All right, Dale, let's finish up with the life lessons. Sometimes when you look at the throne, you see beauty. What you see is real. Sometimes when you look at the throne, you see a lion. What you see is real. Sometimes when you look at the throne, you see a slain lamb. What you see is real. Sometimes when you look at the throne, you see a father and a son. What you see is real. And always your appropriate response is the four living creatures said, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Is that okay? Will you play that song one more time? Oh, I got off of it. Oh, can you find it? Yep. So now enjoy this one more time and the lesson is yours and thanks for coming. So is what you were saying is Jesus was uh, smashed, kind of like the coyote gets smashed. No, I wasn't saying that at all. <laughs> I'll talk to you later, Kate. Let's, let's talk after class. Go ahead and play the song. To him who sits on the throne, on the throne and to the land. Feel free to sing if you want. Be praise and honor and glory and power. To him who sits on the throne and to the land and to the land. Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. 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 To him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, to the Lamb. Be praise and honor and glory and power. Father, lots of different kinds of lives are represented in this little classroom this morning. And for those who are on top of the world, we praise you and thank you. And, and for those of us that are on top of the world, help, help us this week to look to the throne. And for those of us that are in the pit, that are struggling, some of us with issues that are just not going away, or we know people that are going through that, or we have loved ones that are going through that, help us as well to look on a regular basis, to look to the throne and to know that that throne someday will be among us. Through Jesus we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Have a wonderful rest of your day. We haven't been doing a little bit.